Okay, thank you everybody for joining us on Weekend Wild Webinar by Details. Today we go on to the session. I'll quickly introduce about our venture. So we curated this platform to bring in more stories from forests, more researchers and their findings, conservationists and their modules, and naturalists uh, to speak about the things they love for to a wider spectrum of people. In that notion, we have two kinds of program known as weekend wild webinar like this one. And we also have a children's exclusive event called Learn Around Nature. And today's session is very important, especially during this time. It's hosted by Yuvan, he's an amazing writer and uh, a social activist. And he has been involved in various environmental issues. Today he'll be speaking about how nature, edu he's also an amazing nature educator. He has worked in setting up curriculum on nature education with different schools. Uh, today he'll be te teaching us, I mean, telling us about how nature education can have a holistic development in uh, children's life. And he's, he'll also be sharing uh, various life uh, lesson plans and activities he has been working on. Thank you so much, Yuan, for joining us. We see lots and lots of parents and teachers waiting to see your session. So over to you now. I'll mute myself and you can share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Um, happy to be here. And thanks for having me. Let me share my screen. Once again, sorry for the interrupting. Uh, if this, yeah. uh, UN will be hosting it for first 40 minutes and we'll open the session for question and answers. So the, if the Zoom session will end after 40 minutes. You can use the same link to join back the session and I will quickly write down links of all our social media pages so that you can follow us for more webinar updates and products. Thank you, sorry, over to you, muting. So, <clears throat> one second. You can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah. So you can disable the annotation also. I'm so sorry, I'm stressing it again. Disable annotation. The most well, let me see where that is. Disable parts. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, hello everybody. I'm Yuan, and um, a large uh, part of my work is uh, engaging with uh, children, and uh, especially uh, about and in uh, a natural setting. And what what I wish to do in this session is to uh, share with you uh, some activities I've evolved with and, and uh, for uh, uh, children ac across ages and um, uh, and by doing so uh, not the lesson itself but to kind of share and discuss the intent and and the underlying philosophy and doing which I want to share uh, uh, the work of other people I, I draw from and and uh, keep as my touchstone. Um, and uh, perhaps in the, in the end, we could uh, have a kind of an osmotic exchange of, of ideas and, and questions. So um, this slide is, is basically a kind of confluence of uh, what I work in and, uh, and what this session is about in a sense, and also uh, a confluence actually. And before I kind of go into the uh, session, uh, uh, proper. I just want to ground it in a kind of an introduction. So my schooling has throughout been in a, a Krishnamurti school. Uh, it was, uh, it's called The School in Chennai. And Krishnamurti is a philosopher and uh, who radically uh, reimagined education. Uh, in his words, he said he's concerned with the blossoming of the child as he or she is not as uh, the system or as the syllabus uh, fits or wants the child to grow towards, aspire towards. And during my high schooling, I moved out uh, due to various uh, pressures and circumstances. I decided I will uh, move out of a kind of a conventional schooling space. And I wanted to do my high schooling um, independently study by myself, do a range of other things, and also, you know, happen to educate myself 
in the whatever subjects there are and so i uh, i reached out to the principal of my school his name is g gautama and he is a, a visionary in uh, human centric and and child centric uh, education in india and and i uh, and a lot of my ideas are, are rooted uh, uh in what i drew from in my interactions with him and uh, you know under his mentorship and care and so i, I told him this saying I, i want to move out and he said so he was starting uh, another krishnamurti school it was already run, running called patashala in the uh, agrarian fields and uh, wetland landscapes of kanchipuram uh, a large uh, 100 acre school so i was there and i i was writing i was uh, you know playing music i was interacting with the children teachers and i also happened to uh, do the subjects and uh, you know registered a separate center in chennai for my exams go write my exams come back and my high schooling went uh, that way and when it came to um, college so there were the i was at crossroads and there was a lot of pressure to take college uh, and university the the formal conventional way uh, and apply and and write the exams and so on while a part of me wanted to walk out of all that Yeah. Uh, I guess human has uh, some problem with the net. He has gone. Yeah. So we'll wait one second. Let him join back. Yeah. So human is not here. One second. He'll just join back. Yes, he's here. Hello, you want? Hello, you want? Hello, you want? Yeah, you are there. Sorry, I thought I should have started the meeting with a prayer to the internet gods. The internet <laughs> hasn't. So, right. Just, if I go in and out, I change my connection. Hopefully, it works well. Yeah, yeah. So, oh. yeah. Let me share again. okay so I, so i was at this crossroads for college and this was a time i was reading uh, uh krishnamurti morris gibbons uh, robert mcfarlane uh, annie dillard uh, fridge of capra and a lot of these readings and learnings uh, gave me strength to vacate leave the path and uh, kind of craft my own uh, uh, what do you call path in the post high school uh, scenario so i did my 
a college to distance uh, education. Uh, I first enrolled for zoology, of course, the contact classes at dissection. So I moved on to physics, uh, where, well, oh, and I finished the degree, whatever. But in the process, I, 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 I taught, I, I traveled, I wrote, I, I had a lot of uh, interesting conversations and uh, with children and with adults. And so this is the space I'll be uh, speaking from. This is the undercurrent, the subtext. And interestingly, a lot of uh, contemporary philosophers who have envisioned a different kind of education uh, have uh, said that for the uh, rounded holistic growth of a child, there needs to be uh, uh, in, uh, interaction with nature. Now, let me put my video on. Um, uh, one of them is, of course, right now I, I'm part of a Montessori school and uh, we run, I'm part of running a farm school where children uh, learn about sustainable farming and about landscape and ecology because it's part of the Montessori philosophy that children learn in a natural setting, especially in their sensitive ages. Not just because to know the trees' uh, names and the birds' names, but for one's own uh, emotional, uh, social growth. And one book, I hope you can see it. Uh, is, is it like visible? Sorry? No, your screen is there, but then the book is not visible. Fine. Okay, what I'll do is I'll show the books in the end. So this is called From uh, Childhood to Adolescence. Uh, where Montessori talks about this. And, and the other would be uh, Instead of Education, John Holt. And two other uh, psychologists who have uh, scientifically looked at why uh, an immersion in a natural setting, in outdoor spaces, um, are uh, Gail Melson and Peter Kahn, who, who have spoken about uh, its, uh, its uh, critical role in... Um, the ethical, moral, cognitive, as well as spiritual growth of children. And of course, the other person is Richard Luke, who's written a book called The Last Child in the Woods, just about this. So I'm going to move on. I'm going to share a few activities uh, and then kind of look at the, uh, their basis, their intent, and, uh, and kind of uh, move on with that. So this is... So uh, July 3rd, my, my school starts. So the first module I'm doing with children is inspired from, uh, uh, sorry, some of the uh, work I've been during, uh, doing during the lockdown, which is uh, with, uh, with various campaigns which have been happening. One of them, uh, uh, very, very uh, novel and, and powerful, is for Dehing Patkai. So this is the elephant and the contrast of the two sides. Uh, Dehing Patkai is the is a largest stretch of low-lying rainforest in India, and here the NBWL allowed for coal mining in a, in a nearly hundred hectares of land uh, where tribals live, where elephants live, and and so on. And the students of the northeast protested radically, and of course we are under lockdown. Our main canvas for protest, the streets are sealed away, so they started doing art. And, and not in any meager measure, but a deluge of art started pouring on social media. Hundreds and hundreds of artwork each day saying, save Dehing Patkai and in all its forms. And uh, so, so something I was also trying to do is I, I wrote to these artists, uh, took some of this art, got it published here and there and uh, tried what I could to kind of amplify these voices. But, but Students, the, the union they formed themselves uh, got the CM to turn around, the Forest Advisory Committee to turn around, look at this. Um, and on June 3rd, all coal mining across the Northeast was stopped purely because of this campaign and where these uh, the youth did not step out of their houses but creatively protested uh, and, and put in their... Uh, uh, work into into a different canvas so, so this lesson is based on this and inspired from this and it's it's called artivism and let me uh so this is the this is the basis one is 
art form is a powerful media to express solidarity support dissent dissent is not something we often uh, speak about or teach to uh, children um, um, and perhaps art is a is a meaningful uh, way of uh, doing that and often uh, mainstream school is about subduing a child to obedience you know listen to what i say this is quite as is all the other lessons is counter current to uh, to the suppression and and uh, obedient doing of the child so art can also be a powerful way of uh, sensitizing uh, children to social uh, environmental issues perhaps more than the uh, written word and and to see something through art and and uh, think of ways to express uh, through it uh, i'm 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 actually collaborating with three of my uh, artist uh, amazing artist colleagues to do this because i don't do art i i, I kind of frame these ideas and then uh, take help from people to to uh, execute it the other thing art can do is uh, uh, what i've seen uh, some of my friends and colleagues do is um, it can uh, be a tool for nuanced issues for instance gender or child safety which cannot be very uh, se uh, sensitively uh, spoken about in that sense or or uh, you know or, or a child cannot comprehend it through text as such but art is a good way of of doing it and and kind of uh, keeping the integrity and the complexity of of the issue and i'm sure some of you know uh, some uh, examples of that so let me show you some of the art which is evolved and some of what it communicates before i tell you what uh, this lesson uh, looks at so this is by jumon takuria he is a class 10 student in assam and he has uh, metaphorically shown uh, the violence uh, coal mining can rot upon uh, the elephant and and forests um, and it it is though the deng patkai coal mining plants have been dropped it is it speaks about right now also what uh, the center has opened up a 41 coal auctioning uh mines to uh, auctioning uh, coal mines to private players in in elephant tiger and and tribal lands um this is also very interesting and it speaks about uh this is by arjit singh it speaks about man human conflict so there's coal mine at the back and the elephants have come into the paddy fields and often farmers when they lose a, a portion of their years work there are retaliatory attacks and i think recently we we all also reacted to an, a single elephant death uh which was in retaliation to saving farmlands but the a deeper issue being habitat loss and i think this uh, portrays that beautifully this is by kausik uh completely through pencil doodles and uh, this this is a very interesting piece for me this is by mihika sen and she uh, is portraying her knowledge of the law in this piece of art all of these animals are schedule one creatures uh, animals having the highest protection under the law uh, and which are found in deng patkai the sun bear the tiger the slow loris kulak gibbon elephant uh, and uh, chinese pangolin and so on so so other movements have uh, have taken this up uh, and kind of followed queue for of the ing patkai uh, one of it uh, i mean a lot of them the dibang valley uh, molam national park uh, the goans were fighting for it and this is uh, vedandangal and vedandangal right now is under threat because the government is trying to denotify about 40% of this lake wetland complex uh, which which is a great and rare model of community conservation the people here have been protecting these birds for over two centuries as far as literature records it they denotifying it to allow for industries to expand and this is a piece of work by uh, kruti patel and she shows farmers to one side and uh, the birds nesting this is my spriti choudhury the torn wing of the black headed ibis uh i think this is very powerful 
in, in what it's trying to say. Uh, this is by Anusha Men. Um, the egret looking into the pipe, which some of you may have seen or, or heard about, are, uh, around these industries within the sanctuary are suffering from um, uh, acute groundwater pollution and, and skin disease and crop failure because of the tox toxic effluents going into their farmlands. And uh, uh, yeah. So, what, what is this activity? So first, uh, the, you orient, we orient the children to, uh, with, with a story like Deng Patkai. I think it's, it's perhaps the most radic radically artistic protest I've ever seen. Um, and then we either air some issues which uh, it's close to the heart of the children or they know about, or we suggest some issues which they could go and find out about and come back or they can choose issues which are current and contemporary. And first they make a research report. So uh, this is a broad uh, format for the report. Uh, the habitat, where is it geographically, uh, what is its significance, the biodiversity found there, what is unique about its life. The people in any kind of environmental uh, destruction, there are local people being affected. It may be in Ladakh, it may be in Thar, it may be in, in Western Ghats rainforest. There are people living there, just like the tigers and the trees who are uh, part of that ecosystem like the rest of the creatures there. And uh, um, yeah, so what are the laws? What are, what are the campaigns going on? What is your stance? So, so the children go and cre create a format and, and, uh, uh, and become knowledgeable about the issue. A lot of this art was created from a deep knowledge and research about the issue. And once they are they present and submit their research format, they, um, they then uh, you, you use, I'll be uh, handing it over to my art colleagues. They will uh, tell the children about various forms and styles they can use, whether it be you know, painting or sketching or installations. It could explore other kinds of art forms as well, protest poetry. There are a lot of good examples for that. And, uh, there are some examples of makeup art, where, uh, which I could show you perhaps later this time. Um, and after that, children go, uh, make a powerful piece of art, come back and present it. So in, in, a, in a sense, they understand the issue and take a stand, become opinionated and uh, express uh, through uh, this form. And after that, there could be some space for reflection. What personally appealed to me about the issue I chose? What are to me the most significant things I learned and learned while researching this issue and making art for it? And also if the child can track this issue over a period of time, did it succeed? Did it, did it lose? There are a lot of instances where people have fought for, but uh, the project has come on there anyways. And other, other examples where it has not, and, and the voice of people has won in a sense. Um, so if the child can also track it in a, 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 over a period of time, that's a, a valuable thing. That is the first lesson. Uh, I'm going to move on. Um, okay, so this is, a, this is a picture I took about uh, close to two years, uh, one and a half years ago. And uh, uh, it was a noon in our farm school and the children were harvesting beans and I was wandering in the fields with my camera uh, looking at the aphid uh, infestations because often that's a place of a lot of uh, ecological drama. And uh, under this specific leaf, uh, I, uh, this leaf actually offered a, a great idea which unfolded into an uh, extraordinary activity I could do with a, a, a vast uh, age group of children. So if you see here, this the black stuff, uh, bean aphids, and they are sucking the sap of the plant. And so they have a parasitic relationship with the plant. Now this guy is, uh, is called the golden back ant, the Camponotus sericeus. It's, it's called various names. And what ants do is they farm aphids. We started farming, I don't know, I don't know when we started making cattle, but uh, ants started farming, rearing livestock some 200 million years ago. Aphids, caterpillars, mealybugs, scale insects. So 
uh, ants kind of hurt them and kind of move them, fly with them when they're establishing new nests into the into the new colony and so on. So in return, what these aphids do is they give honeydew. So it's a very sugary solution ants intake. So the aphid and the ant have a friendship, a mutualism. The ladybirds here are uh, predaceous. They like to eat aphids. And here they are kind of cleaning up the leaf from one end, you know, uh, of the aphids. And then the ant is protecting the aphids. And they, it actually came and chased off these two ladybirds. So, so there is a, a kind of a dynamic uh, relationship web as such. Um, you look at uh, the plant and the ladybug, they have a mutualism. Plant gives a space for the ladybird to live. Ladybird eats up the aphids. The ladybird and the ant, they have competition because these guys are eating up and these guys are dependent on the same resource. Uh, predation is between the ladybird and the aphid. So, um, so this leads to something uh, we did called a relationship web. Now, before we go to a relationship web, let's look at a food web, which schools teach, most schools teach, or all schools teach in, in their ecology and biology lessons. What I want to say here is that in any topic, any subject, in the way it's presented or in the way it is uh, put forth, there is a social construct, an implicit, not in the text, not uh, obviously, but in, in, in its context, there is a very clear social construct. Now, what is the social construct here? I'll tell you what I see. One is, there's a very clear hierarchy. There's somebody at the top, somebody at the bottom. It's like, it's like you know, how a corporate runs its business. Um, it only shows one story. It says the it says a single story, which is of animals eating each other. You tell children at a very young age, out there in nature, things eat each other. Here, yeah, that's not quite the case in reality. Of course, they eat each other, but there's a lot more there happening. The other thing is it's linear, you know, like like our in infrastructure projects. So these are some of the social constructs. Perhaps uh, some of you are able to see more and maybe you can put it in the uh, comment section and we can uh, discuss it. Let's look at a relationship with. Um, I'll, we'll go into these a little bit more, but a relationship web looks, unlike a food web, looks at uh, a, a natural, uh, what do you call, a, a, a network in nature through a lens of complexity and, and non-linearity and non-hierarchy. Um, it, it looks at social constructs. So it's a window into which you can explore the social constructs of various uh, ideas and, and educational uh, models and materials. And process perception. We look at process perception uh, a little bit later. This is a relationship web uh, created by uh, children. Now, I'll, I'll tell you how they did it. I just want to ask if I'm still audible. Sai, can you give me a heads up on that? Yes, you are. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so, in a relationship web, six kinds of relationships are looked at. Not just predation, but predation, parasitism, uh, mutualism, competition, commensalism. Uh, some of the words maybe we can explain later, but uh, six different kinds. And each relationship is depicted in a different color and then a legend is given uh, i think you, you can see it on the right corner and, and just look at what what has been created it's you'll have to really follow the threads to even comprehend what is happening and that's what's actually happening there six because uh, those are very uh, clear ecological relationships you can add more perhaps you, you're doing it with a younger age group you can uh, have less uh, but the idea is to have multiplicity. There are different things going on. Uh, and if you are choosing to portray one thing, then why is it so? So this, uh, so here the children studied the, the bendy crop, uh, you know, the lady's finger, and looked at various things uh, in there and, and kind of mapped this relationship with um, Let's, let's look at how to do the activity. So this is a table they have. So you need a, a guidebook. You could make it uh, your uh, make your own. I use something called uh, 
urban fauna by um, uh, published by madras naturalist society uh, it kind of covers the common fauna of each uh, taxon you know 10 common spiders 20 common birds 10 common snakes 10 common snails and so on all the common uh, throughout so any, anything you see commonly it is covered there they they fill this table for each thing they see so that uh, they are kind of properly observing what they are seeing um, and so what we said earlier uh, six different relationships each relationship is given a different color and every entity of the web is related to every other entity in some form of the other. So let's say you go into, you go to a banyan tree and you see easily 15 different creatures and then you scatter them across the relationship web. And you, you and um, let's say uh, the, there are six different relationships, sometimes overlapping relationships. There are easily about 50 to 60 lines you have to draw. And that, that uh, kind of uh, engagement in the complexity is both fun and uh, a lot of insights are drawn from that, which I'll, I'll share with you. This is another relationship web uh, done by children. And um, just imagine if I portrayed only predation here, how many lines would be absent? How many colors would be absent? And um, very interestingly, each story is equally valid here. I can choose to tell the story of the food web by following a certain color, or I can choose to tell a different story of the diving beetle, uh, of, of a friendship story, or of a competition story, or of a multi-layered story, which involves several of these. There are so many stories within this. Questions for reflection. So, so some, uh, a relationship web I, I do, uh, you can do from uh, nine year old, 10 year olds, right up till whatever uh, age group uh, children you have, you can engage with because it, it can, uh, you can add complexity to it. Younger classes, could there be more relationships in nature? Are, are we seeing them or will we see them at all? Some of them by, by their very nature. What keeps a relationship web in balance? Also, how do uh, human beings uh, participate uh, in, in a relationship web? Questions for reflection uh, for teachers um, as well as perhaps uh, older children. Um, now, this is a quote I've taken from a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, another touchstone of a book. Uh, I, I draw a, a lot of insight from uh, while um, planning lessons and so on, and I keep going back to if citizenship is a matter of shared beliefs. I believe in the democracy of species. So she looks at an ecological web as a democracy, not in, in some uh, political sense, but also um, in a sense that each role is viable on its own. And there is no, uh, uh, what do you call, a, a hierarchy as such. And I think uh, that's what... Uh, this this question actually came from a, a, a discussion we had and, and one child happened to say it's like a democracy you know everything has is playing its own role and it's doing its own thing you know and then nobody has to uh, go report to anybody else and so so the so this question uh, was actually a post facto uh, reflection question i came up with and um, when you see this paper do you see the clouds and here we come to something called process perception um this is, uh, this is a question asked by Tiknat Han. And process perception is uh, something uh, somebody called uh, Sita Anantasivan, uh, who runs the Bhumi College, speaks about a lot. And uh, it's about how we, as opposed to object perception, we look at things separately. We see things and in, in our language and in, in our conditioning. But to see the non-physical relationships, relationships are not apparent. They're non-physical in the sense that they are, they exist in the thin air, but they actually hold things together. What kind of a perception is, uh, or 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 a, uh, engagement and activity is required to see these uh, see relationships, not just objects, not naming you know beetle, bird, bug, and you know banyan tree, but but to see relationships. So the idea of a relationship web is also to uh, uh, bring in process perception. What are some other social constructs in other subjects, in other uh, philosophies, teachings uh, uh, exist? 
and what concepts of sciences, humanities, uh, other fields can you use relationship with speech? Um, let's move on. I think we have a, a couple of minutes more before we have to log in back. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so for the new entries, uh, participants, mm -hmm. please uh, use the same link to join back for the session. Yeah. Uh, so this this is a picture from our, our farm school. Um, the, the next session uh, actually uh, deals with so I've kind of clubbed a whole lot of activities together under uh, these three act, uh, kind of broad titles. But what it really uh, underpins uh, or, or what underpins it is the fact that. How do you make nature teacher? How do you create a meaningful frame and move away so that the child learns directly from uh, the, the, the subject matter or, or, or whatever that is being uh, taught? Uh, and how, how do you move the locus of uh, teaching and, and, and the uh, responsibility for the learning process from uh, teacher to student? You know, uh, sometimes you know you are doing a good job as a teacher. When you see yourself redundant, you walk into a learning space and you see you're not needed. Everybody is doing the job uh, and, and kind of there is discussion and there are people asking questions and, and uh, you know, the, it's, it's messy. But, you, you know, you, you've done your job when you have to step away on, uh, you know, you go away to the sidelines and let things happen. If you have to actively direct uh, and, and, and kind of wag your stick, something is not right there about the process. So, um, one of the... Um, one of the texts I use uh, to kind of draw uh, idea and spirit from is something called uh, the Manual of Self-Directed Learning by Maurice Gibbons, who talks about this. And uh, maybe I can put that link on the on the side after after we are uh, done. Okay. So this is a uh, Koturpuram Tree Park. Uh, it is not a protected space, but a space inside the city which. A lot of school children and public built. And, um, and here is a place where I do a lot of modules for children right from uh, age five to, uh, you know, as, as old as uh, um, older classes as well. And um, what, one, one of the things, uh, the story of Koturpuram Tree Park is that this was a PWD land, wasteland. And uh, a group of people decided that uh, this space, uh, you know, they could they could plant native trees, and it can be a space where people come and take care of trees and and be there. Uh, and it was started about 15 years ago, where it was completely barren land. It was a wasteland, and we had to move garbage out. And uh, I was about 11 years, 12 years old uh, when this started and I was part of planting some trees and pouring water and so on. The stories uh, it stands for is that when you take children to a place and you create meaningful interactions for them there, it protects the place. It, it, is, a, it is an oracle for, for that space. And what happened was that uh, recently uh, the, there was some road laying and it knocked down a lot of trees on one side of the park, a lot of them over a decade old. And uh, what happened was a lot of parents, children felt strong about it. Uh, we had petitions going, uh, you know, letters, uh, emails going to the authorities. And, and the PW came back and said, hey, hey, you know, we will make reparations. Uh, you know, they, I mean, it, it might not have been sufficient, but they replaced the trees and, and they uh, kind of financially uh, did something. So, um, so I, I do uh, several modules, I'll, I'll show you one, uh, this is from a, work, a scavenger hunt worksheet I do in uh, Kodopuram Tripa. The first question is about cardinal directions and cardinal directions have a, a, a central role in, in a lot of things I do with children um, because of their uh, era Borodetsky. She uh, studied Aboriginal uh, people whom in their speech, there is no left and right. Left and right assumes, uh, it, it takes for granted that you are at the center. 
So if for any left, I can turn around and then my left and right changes. In cardinal direction, the center shifts from the self to a larger space. So north and south, regards can spin around and north and south are the same. So in their very speech, there is no self-centeredness as such. And then the center exists out there on the earth. And that is supposed to have uh, uh, deeply influenced their uh, perception of the, uh, of the landscape they live in and, and their reality. And they, and they are supposed to have an extraordinary visual and uh, spatial memory of, of uh, uh, hundreds of square kilometers. They're nomadic tribes and, and, and how they can read weather and so on. So, uh, so I, I, I mean, j just think about it. Where's, um, what is uh, located in the northeast of your dining table? Now, when you think about it, watch how your center shifts from self to something else. Or um, in what direction is your kitchen to the hall? So the, the center shifts where in, in that very thinking, in, in, in the place where your consciousness moves to, there is a shift. So um, other things you could do with children is you have a direction quiz. So you, you have a quiz of, uh, you choose a space, it could be your school, it could be some other place where you've taken them. What is this direction uh, to, uh, let's say, the, the people tree? Or the, the people tree is in what direction to the games field? And have a direction quiz. And often, there are a lot of other kinds of little activities you can do with directions. And this is another question from uh, uh, Scavenger and uh, Leaf rolling, weevils. Uh, and they're supposed to find these things somewhere there. So there, there are about uh, 600 trees there. So the children have to go around, find, looking for the uh, nests of the leaf rolling weevils. And, and, and the trees have boards so they can find out uh, what tree they are on and what trees they prefer and what they don't. Uh, this is again uh, from Vedandangal. And this is an exercise in making the expert redundant. I want to go there. I want to show children a few things what Lea Vedandangal is for, about the, the communities which protect it and, uh, and so on. But uh, much of the work, much of uh, their uh, bird identification and so on, one can step aside. And uh, the resource I use is uh, an NCF uh, booklet, which is a fantastic resource. You can open that foldable booklet and 120 common species are there. So there's a table which children have, which we orient earlier, approximate size. So let's say we are talking about um, a cormoran. Yeah, what's the, uh, oh, okay, we are talking about something else here. Wait, what, what is the, yeah, three pi. So what is the approximate size? It's crow, uh, uh, what is it doing, calling, where is it, beak shape? So they fill this table and then they open this and see, and they figure out for themselves what bird it is. and in, in, in that way, there is a lot of uh, conversation amongst themselves and, and it's a, a multi-directional conversation space as opposed to a linear conversation space where I as a teacher is the know-all and the, the children kind of look up to me, come to me and say, oh, what bird is this, you know, um, and so on. You know, sometimes children, uh, especially young children, ask this question and you know, when you know a little bit about birds and bugs and so they, they come to, they take you for something in between an expert and the fortune teller. They come to you and ask, sir, I saw a bird yesterday. What is it? I don't know. So, yeah. So, the other thing I, I kind of strive and struggle with is uh, how do you make activities and education more than visual? How do you include sound and smell and touch? as a viable medium uh, uh, and, and a window to uh, perception and learning, you know, a lot of science even is, uh, is sight oriented and, and, uh, and a lot of learning is sight oriented. Uh, how do you move, uh, how do you include the soundscape, the smellscape, uh, the touchscape, uh, the taste scape? I don't know, I, I, I've not go, gone there yet. Uh, this is an activity with bird calls where the children describe uh, what uh, word is uh, what what it sounds like. Um, uh, describing words and some words have some words. There's a very clear uh, syllable you kind of hear, and a lot of India, you know, local names of birds have that. For instance, the common hawk cuckoo. Uh, of course, Salim Ali uh, called it brain fever bird, but 
the you know, other people call it papiha because the way it kind of articulates its call sounds like that uh, the sweet potato uh, the be careful be careful are things i picked out of how children hear so the red vented bulbul cause sweet potato sweet potato you know somewhat and uh, gray farangle and so so these are examples from uh, what what children kind of heard in the um yeah uh one text i want to mention here where i uh, which i go back to often uh, to see how i can include the more than visual the more than intellectual uh, is the spell of the sensuous by david abram oh i know my screen is very small right now so perhaps i'll show it at the end uh this is uh, uh an activity where uh, one of the activities where i have interwoven the subject so this is for the class 8 and 9 where they are learning about parts of a flower so at our farm these are the common families of flowers and the children know the parts of a flower and so on so when they see a flower this is a key for them so what is the plant type is it a herb or a shrub or a tree where is the flower what is the calyx look like how many petals are there what are the distinct feature so on and then they have an observation table so each flower they look at they note down their observations and then you know if you could perhaps uh, pluck one or two flowers you can come back and ha have an exhibition of what various people found out so uh, okay so these are uh, what i'm broadly calling scavenger hunts nature sleuthing activity trails where the teacher creates a viable frame and moves out and the the child is in direct contact uh with the the natural surrounding and there is a direct interaction conversation with that um one more uh, activity which comes to mind is something called a clinometer which uh uh we have done with class 9 uh, the senior class we need a little knowledge of trigonometry we need a protractor a string and a, a little weight it could be a rubber or something and then you look at the tree along the protractor and see the angle of elevation the string makes with the protractor and then you take uh, three or five averages and then you have a very good uh, what do you call uh, measure of how tall the tree is so that kind of opens up a lot of studies you can do at what height is a crow building its nest on the uh, neem tree or if you have a lake outside or what is the angle of depression and then you know its depth so what is the volume it has just rained so this rain uh, you know how much of the lake has it filled and so on so this, the, there are quite a few things you could do in physics biology mathematics where you interweave uh, uh, uh interaction with the natural surrounding so um this is uh, uh children from our school uh, they are interacting with the villagers and they did a fantastic project where each a small group of children they chose a domain which they are going to go out into the village and find out about understand so they chose things like agriculture livelihoods health traditional knowledge and so on and then they prepared a question app and then we we discussed it and then they went out one of the things the children came back with and i learned and the children learned were all the words uh, the people were using for soil you know sometimes english reduces these terms to one drab word soil the children came back with 12 15 words for soil all kinds of soil you know when after it rains before it rains where something grows where something doesn't grow and they came back with words for land and later on this kind of led me into a uh, uh, you know collecting words uh, in vernacular languages for uh, aspects of landscape ecology and so on and this uh, just before this a few months before this i have i was reading um, so uh, so this is part of uh, language i just want to throw a few quick ideas before we move into the, the maybe a question answer um i was reading a book called landmarks which is uh, this book has been very formative especially for the kids at crossroads where i had to choose between following and vacating the path wandering off and i uh, in that period of uncertainty 
Uh, his book called The Old Ways came to me fresh from a second-hand bookshop uh, from the principal of the school. And I, I read through his work, his voice and work uh, gave me courage to kind of take a radical path and, 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 and trust myself and and move off. So, uh, when I tell a word from Robert McCallum's book uh, called Landmarks, where he's gone all over uh, Britain and, and, and its islands and has collected words of feet and bog and water and and, and uh, 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 project we did the children later on uh, to add strength to that and we, we kind of built on it, we're building on it. Teacher poetry is again uh, the resource I want to introduce there is Lost Words by Robert McFarlane and, uh, and the artist called Jackie Morris. It's a work, yeah. Uh, you and sorry for interrupting. Your, sorry, voice sorry, did you say your voice is breaking. Like I guess your net, net is. Net okay. net. Am I clear now? Yeah, partly. So people want you to repeat the at least this slide for because you are not clear. Sure. I'll just start with the second thing I was speaking about. I was talking about uh, Lost Words, a book by uh, Rob McFarlane and Jackie Moss. It was a book came out on. Even you're still not, uh, you're still not uh, clear. Your voice is still breaking. Yeah. So Ewan has left. He'll come and he'll join us back. Yeah. One minute, he'll just join us back. Yeah, he's here. Huh. You and I have unmuted you. Fine. Am I clear now? Yes. Okay. So, let me start again. <laughs> this is about Lost Words by this author called Robert McFarlane and uh, Jackie Morris. And they, it was an act of protest to the fact that the Oxford Children's Dictionary left out a lot of nature words like kingfisher, acorn, otter, uh, heather and so on. And they said uh, for words like copy paste and, and uh, broadband and things like that, more modern words. And they said if these words go out of children's Im imagination, they, when the actual thing vanishes, we will never know. And then they produced this book of poetry and art, which took all these words which were dropped out and produced something amazing. And that's a resource I use across uh, age groups. To, to kind of evoke poetry for uh, what children see uh, uh, living forms right around them. Uh, and, you know, I sometimes write with them, uh, dabble in a little bit of poetry. But this book is rooted in the fact that uh, children and their uh, imagination has an extraordinary uh, scope and potential to uh, protect and uh, stand for the more than human world. So in that sense, it's a powerful tool. And the last thing, uh, what sustains our city project is something I'm doing with the older classes where uh, each a small group or each child uh, look takes one specific feature, the coast or a marshland or a river or a forest within the city, uh, within Chennai where I live, but uh, something that can be done, uh, I think should be done in any school. And they look at it uh, in all its dimensions, uh, prepare, research about it, and write to experts, not now, but when time permits, do field visits, interact with the locals, uh, interact with activists, look at what are the campaigns going on, what are the threats, understand the laws protecting it, and also learn to read official documents and be part and uh, track what is happening to this place, phased out over a period of time, and be part of uh, creating material for public sensitization and campaigning. And it's uh, it's something I'm starting with the senior classes, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm seeing it shape into something uh, something good. So uh, yeah, with that, I'm I'm at the end of my uh, presentation, and perhaps I just want to end saying that uh, you know a Dalai Lama quote, which stays with me. 
and that he said that if you uh, teach meditation in all schools you can end violence in one generation and i i feel uh, something very similar about uh, a nature education uh, a serious uh, and uh, uh, the uh, well woven uh, nature education curriculum if it's there in each school co properly contextualized to the place it is in i think uh, it will be at the heart of our uh, whatever we've been fighting for campaigning for a lot of you here uh, i know personally and i know uh, the movements you are part of and um, otherwise the other kinds of campaigns so nature education is really a grassroots movement you, uh, and any kind of engagement with children is a grassroots movement and if that aspect is kind of left out the rest of our campaigning rest of our uh, what we are facing is damage control um um so yes i i'd like to end on that note and and maybe uh, move to taking questions thank you thank you so much yuvan that was incredible session you have spoke on several gaps and you have given us so many leads and how we can design the curriculum it it was incredibly curated thank you so much we'll open the session for question and answers and people with the questions can comment on the chat box or if you want you can unmute yourself and ask yes so i've written the links for our pages also there are so many fans there's one question do you want to read nayanthala well let me i'm just opening my chat ha okay should i should i go right up to the uh, top no okay wait. no there's no question there okay sorry could uh, you talk about the role of indigenous folklore in nature education so question is um, could you talk about the role of indigenous folklore in uh, nature education and uh, maybe from your experience yeah something i've been uh, dabbling in recently um um you know uh, languages which are from or which are native to the place uh evoke the place in far greater vividity and uh, you know if we are talking about uh recently uh one of uh somebody i looked uh, as a mentor and i think he did a session for ticket tales recently ashish kotari he was speaking to me about uh, 220 words for snow in himachal pradesh when it falls where it falls how it looks like how it feels like 220 words which which is in the spoken language of the local people there i know just snow it's it's like a drab plain feature in my head but i'd like to learn all those 200 words and see how it kind of branches out in my own head and and vividify snow my own uh, interactions with what children have found fishermen farmers friends tamil literature i've kind of added more than 110 words for land which earlier was was plain and uh, i think i think that's a very uh, a powerful scope and vision uh, native uh, languages and folklore have in evoking uh, the place of uh, a creature or some other uh, life form non life form uh, in our uh, in our imagination and in our lives uh, something else also which i found very fascinating uh, is in the mishmi language where nothing is inanimate the mishmi uh, have a strange community conservation model they are the only uh, uh, tribal people i know who have had the centuries old respect for tigers and in their community forest more than in the wildlife sanctuaries the density of tigers is 4.5 times more and in their own folklore the tiger is an elder sibling and the if to their ancestors that was the first born and the second born was the idu mishmi man so in their language the mountain has life so there's a word for the mountain spirit the tree spirit the river spirit and it it boggles one to think about to, to see these features and and know that they are living and in in its own legitimacy western science may uh, put uh, portray it in one way but i think this is an equally valid uh a cognition of place uh 
more so because of the way these people have been living here in extraordinary harmony with their forest for centuries. So uh, that's broadly my response to uh, Nayantara's question. Um, let me see. Um, uh, Sai, can you help me with the questions? I have, uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I know there are so many questions. Uh, Yuman, could you give a sense of time frame for activities in context to academic year, for example, relationship web? How long or how many sessions would you have for that? And second uh, question is, can you elaborate on the process perception? And thanks. So to uh, run a relationship web uh, activity, first there is an orientation session where you tell the children about these various these things. Perhaps I use that uh, the bean leaf underside story to, uh, to kind of uh, invoke that conversation. And uh, you introduce to them the observation table and, um, and so on. You can do it in your own way. And, and after the, that orientation perhaps uh, takes about 30 to 40 minutes. After that, you will let children out in the field, set them loose. Because uh, they, they, they'll have to look at a certain space. It could be your, it's something you could do during the lockdown. It could be within your compound confines. That could be your context. Or it could be a single large tree. It could be a crop. Or it could be a piece of garden which, which you're, you're looking at. Um, um, you give them about an hour's time to go and observe. Look under everything. Under leaves, under litter, under rocks. Perhaps give them a magnifying glass too. Um, they go and then they come back and they do a little bit of research to understand these relationships. You know, how is an ant related to a spider? Is it competition or is it predation or is it sometimes both? Sometimes relationships overlap and there are, there are currents and counter currents within the relationship with. Um, so they do some research, scatter these on a chart. And one thing which the younger children did was they, so the, they didn't write the names, but they kind of drew the pictures of the different animals and that, that had its own. I wish I had the pictures. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, so that takes about uh, another 30 minutes at least. And then it's nice to have a discussion around it. Uh, each child or each small group presents their relationship with what they found, what they learned, uh, what they observed and what uh, helping us make meaning and sense from the uh, web they drew. So I think that's a staggered three hours which you can plan around the relationship. Wow, that's amazing. Sorry, was there, a sec there was a second part of the question, right? Yeah, one second. Um, uh, can, you, uh, can you elaborate on the process perception? So this is from the work of uh, Goethe and other people who look at uh, diverse kinds of perception. And... The, uh, the one thing which uh, Western science, uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not kind of pushing it away. It has its uh, extraordinary, what do you call, uh, upcomings. Uh, but one thing which, uh, which underpins it is something called object perception, uh, which, uh, and the English language too, where you look at things within boundaries as objects, as separate things. Uh, something... Uh, uh, Robin Wall Kimura talks about in a book is about languages, how some languages are noun verb languages. English is a noun word lang verb language where it has more nouns, names, more than the relationship between the names. So you end up speaking in, in, in fragmented pieces of, of your place than in, in the non physical spaces between them. As something like Tamil or a lot of Indian languages. Our verb noun languages, they have more words for the relationships than the separate uh, uh, names. Uh, so process perception is engaging with your perception and seeing how you can create, uh, come about uh, activities and, and, uh, and so on to look at uh, processes as well. For instance, when uh, Thich Nhat Hanh put that question, when you see this paper, do you see the clouds? Now, if it's a, from object perception, you can't see the clouds if you see paper. But it requires process perception for you to see paper, tree, soil, rain, cloud. 
all of that is there in that paper but object perception does not really uh, is not inclusive of that or for instance when you see a plastic bottle do you see the albatross i know some of you would have seen the that that movie no it's difficult and some of a lot of consumeristic uh, and and uh, capitalistic uh, thinking uh, is from object perception and and materialism is from object perception as a lot of indigenous communities it's completely a, a process perception that's that's nice so we are, we have we are already running out of time we got only 10 minutes so would you like to like begin the session again or uh, answer for another 10 minutes or more um you, i don't know you, you tell me uh if if you have energy we are okay with the beginning no, the i'm fine i'm fine so whoever is interested to come back and we can continue the discussion yes awesome so the next question is have you modified your activities and curriculum modules for online learning during the pandemic yes i have for instance the artivism is uh, an online learning uh, thing um under the nature sleuthing we are doing something called homes in our home where children kind of go around their compound and uh, see what lives in their spaces uh, we we have a certain observation activity and then a way of presenting it and uh, the the what sustains a city is again uh, a online learning thing uh and and so on so a lot of these ideas can be easily translated uh, uh, through action at a distance i don't need to physically be there i just have to set the frame and let the children lose so one person wants to know the list of books you have been talking okay so i want to start with the school i'm working in so the extraordinary thing about the school i am in is uh, if i am able to speak with 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 a certain sense of empowerment is because it is given centrality to this kind of education as opposed to you know sometimes in schools environmental education is uh, given to children who uh, find maths or science difficult i mean it has its validity but it's kind of sidelined in that sense and if i was in that location i don't know if i would be able to speak the way i do or do the work i, I am doing uh, in in uh, so so you know the the director of my school sometimes tells me i think this is more important than studies go ahead and do it so that kind of an empowerment is important and our, our school is a montessori school and can you see the book so this is called from uh, childhood to adolescence where montessori talks about the importance of a child growing in a natural setting interacting with soil trees and sky for his or her own holistic growth and along the same vein last child in the woods by richard lewis uh, who speaks about uh, the child in the outdoors as an endangered species and why it's uh, crucially important to uh, include some of the things we've been speaking about in uh, mainstream curriculum this is robert mcfarlane's landmarks uh, uh, indigenous word lists this is a book by krishnamurthy and a lot of krishnamurthy's conversations spring from uh, from nature and this is talks with students in varanasi but the other books i would uh, suggest are commentaries uh, of uh, living this is john holt instead of education a, a beautifully uh, counter current uh, manuscript to mainstream industrial education Uh, which I go back to, and okay, I'm just going to show you two more. Last words by Robert McFarlane. Ah, uh, spell of the sensuous by David Abraham, uh, David Abraham, and this is letters from a forest school in Odisha, uh, a, a initiative where they are running a school for tribal children, taking into account their own learning capacities and and context. Uh, this is also a beautiful book. yes thank you so much and then uh, someone wants to know how to expose a child who has entered the adulthood uh, to the nature and how to get him realize the importance of being exposed to nature i 
frankly, I find it challenging. Uh, for instance, if uh, sometimes I have to engage with a class which hasn't been sensitized to these elements, and suddenly uh, I mean they are 14 years old, 15 years old. When you have to engage them, it's it's uh, it's difficult. And unless there's a natural, organic uh, path uh, life takes, and and there's something uh, opens up, uh, um, I I think that way they can kind of lead back to it. But I've found it challenging, as opposed to some of the children I've worked with. Since they were ages five, six, seven, even nine, you catch them there, and then you have to do very little after they grow up. Uh, your your work is done uh, as a teacher, and you uh, even the smallest of experiences at a young age, if one is able to give, that imprints deeply. And um, I don't know. I I cannot entirely uh, respond to that question because I do struggle with. For instance, sometimes I have to take college students on a walk, in uh, you know, to a local birding spot or something, and and I, I find it very difficult to uh, uh, um, interact with them uh, because that is the first of its kind of an exposure they are getting. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. It is wise to begin early. So the methods and activities that you spoke about are fundamentally and radically different from existing mainstream education system for you. Does nature education act as alternative education or do you advocate for its assimilation into mainstream education? Oh, that's a nice question. I think it needs to be a, a part of, of both. Some of the things mainstream education implicitly does is um, it has a frame. And uh, the people who make these syllabi have interests and they want uh, people to end up in a certain place. And therefore, in a sense, it breaks the spirit of the child when the child is different and is not able to adjust and fit oneself into that frame. Uh, and he or she is either penalized or discarded from the system. So in a sense, a nature education also embraces inclusivity of all kinds of learning abilities. And that should be both counter to what conventional uh, educational model means right now, as well as enter its stream as well. So it needs to be a kind of an undertow into, in, in the mainstream current of things. Yeah, so someone from Philippines, uh, I was struck by how, of course, nature education must be rooted in places. On the other hand, climate change seems to be diffused and the way it's taught can be abstract. How do you tackle the climate crisis in discussion with children? I think that's a, a brilliant question. I think it's Padma. Hi, Padma. Thank you for joining us. And her, her own work is also related to that. And she's finding how this can be articulated in, in all kinds of senses. One of the uh, discourses climate change leaves out is the social aspect. It's, 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 a, it's a kind of a misanthropic uh, uh, concept in, in some of the uh, ways in which it's spoken about. And um, I think locally where I am placed, I have to find my own language to voice it. Where I am, I cannot say climate change to the fishermen. It means nothing. So I have to say coastal erosion, or I have to say uh, speak it in Tamil, and I have to find my own way of articulating. And uh, although it falls in maybe in a larger umbrella, I think local uh, context and, and people uh, showing their own uh, light on it uh, and, and building it in their own way uh, uh, makes it powerful and decentralized. Um, yes, and, 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 and this is something I've been uh, uh, thinking about a lot too. So it's not, a, it's not an entire uh, full formed response I'm giving. Um, so th thank you, Padma, for the question. So uh, Abhishek asks, in hindsight now, do you think obtaining a formal degree in botany, zoology would have brought you to this position? See, my space uh, exists in its uniqueness. Uh, you know, I, I want to recount uh, something Rumi says, uh, the, the brilliant uh, Sufi poet. He says there are 
metaphorically uh, he says there are as many ways to god as the number of people on earth and and uh, and this this was my path and i i don't regret it in hindsight i think uh, um it's i think it's worked out beautifully and at the right time and right places i had the mentors uh, in in person and in non person to to lend a hand or or give me a push so perhaps a formal degree uh, if i had gone into college being the the sometimes stormy uh, you know non linear person i am i would have perhaps done a little bit and then dropped out also I, that's a very likely possibility uh, but, but that i'm not uh, talking about this as an uh, ideal example nor as an example which needs to be emulated and what i'm uh, i'm i tried to really say is uh, um the blossoming of uh, the child the person as one is and and what that may mean and and that and that uh, uh complex uh, journey of finding out so that's it i think any more yeah. um hi uh, you went this is sangeeta Uh, so um there's a uh, i've been attending few of uh, other zoom meetings as well with the children in the mount you know ngos and people working for the children in the mountains and all that giving them education and there was a contradictory thought that they are just uh, having a thought that uh, we are in a different world and then we are enjoying certain things and all that even during this uh, on uh, no lockdown period they feel that we are attending a lot of online sessions children are learning you know and things like that but i feel that we are locked up inside like a jail and then we are talking about uh, you no know, going around the house and uh, you know how to be close with nature around the house but they are already living in the mountains in the nature with very less people in the village you no know, they can have a very different uh, life child their their power their knowledge and then their connectivity with the nature and then uh, we talked about their uh, quality of life no they give more importance to the animals they worship them as god and all that that's how they are you uh, know uh, protecting the nature around them but uh, they are reading or uh, the education in an education perspective they are reading uh, things in our uh, bookish knowledge like how anbuna enna aramna enna but they are already living that way there so they i feel that here in uh, cities we are uh, trying to find out uh, how to be close with nature and all that there they wanted to read and uh, do certain things how do you see this contradiction I, i feel like we have to work more on that telling that education is like this and then uh, it is a connectivity with the nature uh, in even in the future so uh, this is how this uh, this whole thing should work i feel uh, i think i'm little uh, am i explaining yeah, I, it clearly i guess, i i I'm, i'm get i get what you're saying because and, we are uh, moving towards uh, alternative education and all that we teachers or most of the teachers we find uh, we talk about this we are uh, looking for a different curriculum in the cities where it is more uh, connected to the nature like having a farm school or village school kind of that but there it is going different so how do uh, we have to work with a curriculum as a whole for the children who can be uh, so much connected with the nature so i i think we have to work from that end too like telling them education is this as what i mean and then i wanted to tell like these uh, nature and farming and all that is related to some kind of traditional art forms in any kind of it is not about only tamil uh, tradition but any kind of tradition as well so they have their own tribal songs and then that is talking about more uh, words on as you were talking like more words on the plants and then the seasons and then all the history and then geography everything comes between the song and then they just sing and dance in the festivals so how do you take the, those kind of art forms inside this nature oriented uh, yeah it's a pertinent uh, point you are raising My, the first two thoughts which uh, come to mind are uh, the work of uh, sonam uh, wangchuk in uh, ladakh where the uh, the normal education was uh, teaching children who are living in minus 20 minus 30 A for apple is fine. B for ball is fine, but F for fan is a problem for a child living in minus twenty. 
so he did some uh, uh, extraordinary changes in the way education was presented and i think uh, he has done a lot of work in contextualizing education and what uh, i think padma has also men mentioned about decentralizing and the uh, other person uh, who comes to mind is shinamananda adichi her her amazing ted talk uh, the danger of a single story uh, which is available if you search on youtube where uh, children uh, in africa are being uh, taught a western kind of education uh, while there are cheetahs and lions and giraffes roaming right outside they are taught to draw snowmen and and reindeer and uh, caribou and so on so um yes uh, contextualizing uh, i think that's what you're highlighting too and and and, and I, uh, i resonate with that Uh, about the festivals and all that um the art forms we have to bring that because it is going down like we are forgetting lot of songs lot of uh, you no know, art forms that are, that is closely related to nature so we are now uh, moving towards a different kind of art forms that is uh, you know completely away from all these languages and those uh, words that you were talking about and all that so are you including those kind of art things during your nature walk or the songs that you even again if it is Uh, like you no know, different approach like only to the farming is not a matter no it it relates to a lot of we are all interconnected and all these things are interconnected as well we have to uplift all those traditional art forms as well along with the nature is what i feel um so if, if that is a question as to my own work uh, i think um, my own work has not extended to dance or some amount of art is there but in my own school we had a song book which we will sit and sing and it was a collection of songs from all religions all cultures all states and then children would pick songs and they would sing and and that uh, created a, a amazing cross pollination of of ideas and and uh, acceptance and um i I've, i've not been able to do that and i uh, i'll 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 have to see how i i could i should include that because you create as a teacher you create a very great impact in the children i just showed your video to my daughter now and she she studied in abacus and then she said ah you and sir and then she started explaining all the she's just seven she started explaining all her experience uh, so this is how like your your uh, the work that you do impacts a lot in children is what i feel so if you include a lot of other things that is going down as well it's not only nature it's all uh, the traditions everything is going down so if you include all those things it would be a great help for the children thank you so i'll i'll take elton uh, elton's question so how do we implement this type of uh, education across india like can we do this policy change how do we ramp this up so that this type of education is not the privilege of a few uh that's that's a, that's a large question and i'm a bit belittled by it. um the one thing we uh, which i have found uh, which is happening is that there's something called the educational multiverse which is happening in india all these little institutions who are questioning the current education system are coming together uh so that includes bumi college the kfi schools uh the swaraj university barefoot college and other and, and there are other models also which lie also the montessori schools the steiner schools and if there is some way we can meet and uh sound of ideas it's it's been happening uh um and it needs to happen i feel from bottom up i i start with with uh where i am and i and i and i we have discussions like this and then it grows in the way it grows uh if if it could uh, bring about if it could reach the policy makers ears in some sense uh that would be great but what policies do is that they generalize they streamline give you a single shirt to wear across uh uh you know so so that that there uh, one should tread carefully uh but how do we make this uh, uh contextualize and cross pollinatory uh, environment uh yeah i be I'll, i'll dwell on that uh, let's dwell on that question yeah 
Lucy, uh, could you repeat the relationships in the leaf and the ladybugs? And again, please, I could not follow all. So, so there's the leaf and there are aphids on it. So the aphids have a parasitic relationship. They're sucking the sap out of the leaf. So they don't kill it. So it's a parasitic, like the lice on our head. Uh, the ladybugs are eating uh, the aphids. So they are, you know, the predators. The ant is in friendship with the aphid because it protects the aphids it wards off the ladybirds and wasps which come to eat the aphids uh, and in turn the lady uh, the aphids give them honeydew a sugary solution uh, the ladybirds are in friendship with the plant because they have a place to stay as well as they help the plant by grooming it and doing housekeeping eating up the aphids yeah. did i cover no also then there's a competition between the ladybird and the ant because these guys are trying to eat the ant this guy is trying to protect the ant there's competition. So, so that is the mini uh, network within that square inch of space of a bean leaf. Yeah. Uh, I think part of the problem with formal education is that it tends to be blind to ecological literacy. Yeah. So I guess the last part of Elton's question was, or even what I have in mind is, uh, these alternate schoolings, are not accessible to everybody. One factor is that it is not affordable, not for everybody. So he wants to know how this privilege of few can be extended to like at least, you know, large percentage of population or parents. So would you like to say more on that? That's a vast question. And I, I don't know if I'm, I'm in the right location to, uh, um, answer that. For instance, my school has a scholarship program, so which it allows it's open to uh, underprivileged, uh, whatever kind of privileged children are in, and there are such examples around. And if we as teachers also uh, volunteer and and kind of create a gift culture of teaching, so I go out of my uh, you know um, way and and uh, go to a government school or or a group of children uh, and and. Uh, teach them or, or introduce them to something. Those are two things I'm able to think about and I have done. But how that can be uh, vastly implemented, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a political question and it's, uh, it, it kind of uh, deals with a lot of social and class goals. Uh, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I'll have to stay and incubate uh, the question. Right. Can what? I can I add to uh, add to this? Sure. If if we have some time, um, uh, so when we are talking about implementing such kind of education across the country, um, one of the important things we we um, we are looking at how alternative education differs from mainstream education is the way they inculcate values in, in the way that they make the child think the critical thinking component that that that's a lot of times like uh, like you and rightly said that uh, you know in the mainstream education the children are forced into uh, obedience right so um, the the um, um, the education uh, policy makers uh, had had thought about this and um, so I'm not defending the system but I'm just trying to share something that's uh, that was there a little so louder to, uh, yeah so they tried to the policy makers tried to bring this comprehensive and continuous continuous evaluation system because a lot of things depend on uh, how the children are evaluated the reason why the system is like this is because we evaluate them based on their marks but the system that uh, that they tried to bring in was a uh, comprehensive and continuous evaluation which uh, looked at a lot of activities that the children had to do and that failed because the teachers couldn't um, couldn't do this to continuously evaluate children based on their um, this looked at everything like they looked at the this system looked at how the children answered the questions whether they participated in the group activities uh, how was the how was the child able to perceive the questions? Whether that child understood the the so what happened is this this failed because the teachers couldn't uh, put uh, put a lot of thinking in a, in a way the system 
entirely uh, is flawed not only in the way we inculcate education but the way even teachers deliver their education so this is where the alternative schools differ because the teacher puts in a lot of effort as as i understand alternative schools a lot of curriculum uh, is designed by the teacher himself and it is himself or herself and it and it is entirely up to them to uh, you know design what they want to teach how they want to teach because there are set um, if i understand this correctly there are set targets but how you uh, achieve them is up to you as a teacher so that is where uh, this system differs and if we look at what are the objectives here this is exactly why the system why the contemporary education um, across the country uh, like bringing this type of contemporary this type of change in contemporary education will require us to change what we want to achieve out of it so this is this is what i i wanted to point out even in the beginning so it's it's good that we are having this kind of discussion because it seems like there is a small set of people who are interested in uh, talking about uh, nature education and, and and education framework in general because i think there are some teachers here so this is brilliant uh, uh, platform where we can talk Th there is a lot more to to this and and it it cannot be said in just two words but uh yeah if there is already existing platform we could put out such thoughts and like you know if some of you are in into policy making and all these are things that are usually discussed so yeah that's that's all i wanted to contribute if uh, what i might have uh, what if i can add to what uh, sneha is saying also what what comes to my mind is can a large any kind of system um if if a school had 5000 children can it run in a child centric child friendly manner or a business for instance if uh, the employees are 10000 uh, million in number can it be employee centric now i want to draw upon the metaphor ef shuma for uses in economics small is beautiful and in if you, if you read uh, gandhi's work he also speaks about how he envisioned india as a great expanse of small villages um and there's somebody called dunbar who is who has uh, done work on um, how what uh, keeps communities running when is it that everybody knows each other's names and then there's a good relationship with everybody and he he comes up with this uh, number between 150 uh, to 200 of course uh, some schools are bigger than that but this is a kind of an ideal number um so that, that's his work and uh, something about good solutions good practices comes with being small uh and 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 then not uh, uh, and not uh, adopting the the growth model or the largest better uh, model uh that that uh, Yeah, I just want absolutely, to say. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, is agree. what they were telling, like student-teacher ratio and all that matters, like working. So, Sai, will you? Uh... Right. That's that's right. Yeah. I have one question. Like, do we have that many committed uh, teachers or even teachers to, you know, focus on like students-teachers ratio and? like how how could this this be implemented to the huge population country like india like you know they they the uh, government school don't even have teachers you know like they combine classes i i know it's a long way to move on okay so any more questions uh batma has written a passage i just want to say hi to some friends here hi Amiga and uh, Gautam sir, hi Siddharth, uh, hi Ranjini, um, hi Nayantara. Uh, let me see, hi uh, Vignesh. That's uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have some ideas. So before we end the thank you for this wonderful session. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sneha. We had a nice time hearing your perception too. Rethink my beliefs. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you everybody for joining us. We had a wonderful session. Thank you, Yuvan. It was incredible. We we got so many leads on 
the nature education or education as such. So I'll end the session now.